What's up, Classic WoW fans? Today we're going to take a deep dive into the meta of Warsong Gulch. We will discuss the best team compositions, break down the map in detail, and talk about exactly what each class should be doing at different stages of the game. Obviously PvP is situational by nature, and not every Warsong Gulch match plays out the same way. This video will be focused specifically on how you should approach a game versus a skilled enemy pre-made running an ideal setup. Everything we will discuss revolves around how the match plays out when both teams are organized and respect each other's ability to outplay. Every class has something that they do better than anyone else. This means that everyone has a very specific job to do in a structured pre-made environment. That is the type of gameplay that this video will cover. The optimal team composition in terms of class setup is one druid, two mages, a rogue, a warlock, a hunter, a warrior, a shaman or paladin, and two priests. This is pretty universally accepted to be the ideal Warsong Gulch setup. However, you won't always have the perfect classes available, and neither will your opponents. There are ways you can tweak the setup and remain viable, and there are also ways to hard counter enemy teams due to the rock-paper-scissors nature of the vanilla classes. For example, two hunters can be very strong against caster-heavy teams or teams that are using mage flag carriers. Two warriors is great on the horde side when coupled with the power of a shaman. Running three mages can be helpful if your druid is undergeared or struggles to run flags. Two rogues can be useful if there's a particularly good enemy druid giving you trouble. And shadow priests can be decent defenders, synergizing well with rogues and hunters. So, while there definitely is room for tweaking the setup, assuming you have all classes available, what you see on the screen is the best possible composition. Now let's go over the map itself. Most people are pretty familiar with the layout of Warsong Gulch, but knowing what to call specific areas of the map is absolutely crucial for effective communication in a pre-made versus pre-made game. Being able to give concise and specific information to your teammates is one of the most important aspects of pre-mating. Saying, the druid ran outside is a bad callout. Saying, druid out graveyard, heading to fence is a good callout. It quickly tells your teammates exactly what is happening and allows them to respond accordingly. It's also important to know what to call the different areas of the base so that your teammates can track enemy flag carriers in real time. Most people know what roof, balcony, and flag room are. The middle room of the base is usually referred to as lobby or connector. Call this little ramp that leads up to the roof banana in order to avoid any confusion. Now it's time to jump in the battleground. At the beginning of the match, have your rogue burn the boots in your tunnel and then position himself in flag room or on balcony. Balcony is usually the strongest position because you can easily respond to an incoming from any direction and you can quickly connect on the EFC no matter what route he takes. Just don't be too predictable with your position or you'll get AoE'd out of stealth. Remember, your rogue is your primary defender, and if the flag is home, he should always be there. Your hunters should track and harass the enemy druid and mages to prevent them from easily entering your base. With good positioning and well-placed flares and traps, your hunter can force enemies to use a lot of cooldowns and mana just to get into the base, making them an easy cleanup kill for your rogue. Your Warlock can play mid initially, but he should be the first class to fall back and defend if the Hunter and Rogue need help. Warriors and Healers are your death squad and should be focused on controlling mid and splitting the enemy res waves in the early game. Depending on how much control your team has, your Warlock and Hunter can kind of rotate between mid and defense. Rogue needs to stay put in flag room though. Meanwhile, your Druid and Mages should be attempting to enter the enemy base and get the flag out. If the enemy team is playing properly with a Hunter, Warlock, and Rogue defending, this will be fairly difficult. There will usually be some positioning mind games between your mages and the enemy defense, but there are lots of ways to get into the bases, if you get creative. I really hope they leave these jumps in the game for Classic. They're a fun way of raising the skill cap, and some of them are pretty difficult to pull off under pressure. Anyway, I like to send both mages with the Druid to go for the flag early on, but some people prefer to keep one mage in the midfight. It mostly depends on your opponent's setup. Regardless, your druid should be trying to stealth in and get the flag out while the mages peel for him. If your flag team is having trouble getting out, send a healer with them. Paladins, in particular, are very strong in this role. Your druid is obviously your primary flag carrier, but depending on the defense, mages are arguably the better class for getting the flag out of the room itself. Polymorph, Blink, 
Nova, Cone of Cold, and Ice Block are amazing tools for escaping the flag room that a druid lacks. If your druid is having trouble with the enemy rogue, have him wait in stealth while a mage brings the flag out to him. Just be careful making the pass if you don't know the enemy rogue's position. <laughs> When both flags are taken and both FCs are passing through mid, your team's top priority should be protecting, peeling, and escorting your flag carrier. One of the most common mistakes people make in Warsong Gulch is going tunnel vision and chasing after the EFC in mid before their own flag carrier is safe. It is very difficult to kill a well-played druid in mid because he has so much space to work with. So if your initial defense fails to stop the enemy druid, it's usually best to just forget about him and worry about helping your own team's flag carrier get to safety. There will be some times that you do want to take the mid fight here to try and net an easy cap, but the stars have to align in terms of positions, available cooldowns, and the res timer. Nine times out of ten you should just focus on getting your own flag carrier across to safety. No, just don't stop running, I got you, I just rest. I'm stopping mounted guys. Yeah, just stop him, stop him, stop him. In these situations, everyone needs to peel and escort except for your rogue. As soon as the EFC makes it into mid, your rogue should be mounting up and trying to get in position on the enemy roof as quickly as possible. Against a good team, it's unlikely your rogue will be able to get there before a flare or blizzard spam is up, but the very best rogues are the ones that can slip into unexpected positions and catch EFCs off guard when they are low on cooldowns or away from their healers. If your rogue is able to get into a position where he has potential for a clean opener on the EFC, your offense should play around the rogue. Wait until he can sap a healer and get a full stun lock set up before your team engages. Egg's still roof, he fapped already? He's already fapped? Jump down balcony, balcony. If the EFC is safely behind a flare or blizzard spamming mages, your rogue should try to lurk ahead of the action, away from the initial team fight. Your rogue should sit wherever you expect the EFC to run first when he has to start kiting. Usually this is balcony or ramp. In this situation, your warriors, warlock, and offensive healers need to play aggressively to try and force the EFC into your rogue. Either way, the end goal is for your warrior, rogue, and dispels to all connect on the EFC at the same time. If this happens, he will almost always die, especially if your warlock has death coil ready to secure the kill. Now track has it. Cypress, blow him up, blow him up, come on! I'm on him. Nice! Yes! Fuck yeah. Good <laughs> We already started talking about offense a bit when we went over how rogues should reposition once the flag is stolen, but let's take a look back at the map before we go any further. At this point, both flag carriers are safe at their bases and ready to cap. We'll call this the stalemate phase. You'll want to use a slightly different setup during this part of the match, and it will basically be a tug of war between the two defenses to see who can survive longer. When the game reaches a stalemate, you should send your warrior, lock, and two healers on offense. Your rogue should already be lurking at the enemy base to join them. At this point, your mages should join your hunter in setting up a choke point at your own base's banana. Your FC should be sitting on roof. Having a priest or shaman on defense to quickly dispel enemy faps is a must. A coordinated fap push will rip right through your mage and hunter, and your FC will be in trouble. It's crucial for your defense healer to avoid getting CC'd when the enemy offense makes their push. Use Skull of Impending Doom, Restoration Potions, and Line of Sight to stay out of CC so you can dispel those faps. The standard flag carrier defense setup is extremely difficult to break if faps get dispelled quickly and the hunter and mages are playing well. Once the game is in this state, if the teams are evenly matched it will usually take a long time for one of the FCs to die. Offense needs to be patient for multiple attempts and make sure they're synchronizing their fap cooldowns. If your offense does manage to make the enemy flag carrier jump, they need to be vocal and give constant updates on the EFC's position and where he is kiting next. Try to force him into a spot where your rogue and warrior can connect. 
have your Warlock save Death Coil for when the EFC is low. This phase of the game can get pretty stressful because both your offense and defense need to be communicating and voice chat can get a little cluttered. The offense team needs to be constantly communicating about the enemy flag carrier's position and how much kill potential there is. Your defense team, meanwhile, needs to be communicating important information like keeping track of the enemy rogue and telling your team's flag carrier what areas are safe for him to kite to. It really helps to know each other's voices well and keep communication short and to the point. Even good pre-mades often end up with offense and defense shouting over one another, which is a recipe for disaster. Keep your composure here and let the offense and defense teams work separately. Okay, I'll just for round other is the king gold, so. Yeah, we're killing it. Oh, we need to wait to uh, yes. Ram, you can go behind. No, we need to still need you. So we need to uh, you let us know what what you're gonna just don't let him jump. We're gonna push from the ramp. Holy and you just, just shitty just game. Don't man. let him go in. If it looks like your flag carrier is going to die, defense needs to tell offense to position for a repick. This can be tricky. <laughs> I guess it's GG then. Yeah. Not yet. I'm coming out of tunnel. Not yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come to me. Your defense needs to call for the repick as early as possible because you need enough time for someone on offense to actually get into position to repick. But you also don't want to call for a repick too early. If your offense moves to repick but your FC ends up surviving, then you've just given up all of your offensive pressure for nothing. It's worth noting that the smart play here in the clip would have been to drop the flag for a mage, but I was already in full hero mode and neither of them said to drop, so I made a risky decision to run it myself. Fortunately, it worked out because the druid was able to get it. Feel me, feel me, feel me. I gotta push it, I gotta push it. Okay, pick it up. Just like your defense needs to tell your offense ahead of time when a repick is necessary, your offense needs to tell your defense when they should get ready to cap. When your offense has a guaranteed kill set up, your FC and defenders should jump down to the flag room to cap. But this can also be a tricky call to make. If your FC jumps down, but your offense fails to get the return, then your flag carrier will be in trouble. He's extremely vulnerable in flag room due to having limited ability to kite. Yeah, go, go, go. They're doing everything. Rocket helm, everything. Go. Go, right, go. Get that fat off for you. Offense, offense, go. It's easy to see how important it is for your offense and defense to be able to communicate and trust each other's calls. This is probably the hardest part of playing out a long match against a good team. Stay calm, keep the communication flowing, and don't tilt and rage at each other. This is also part of why having a consistent pre-made with the same players is so important. People need to know each other's voices, know each other's tendencies, and be able to separate the offense and defense conversations, as well as your two groups really needing to trust each other's calls. Oh my god, Kadir, what the fuck are you doing? Why are you charging this fucking mage? Man, you literally run into five people. You literally run into fucking five people. Thanks for the games, boys. I have to go. Good game. Good game. Good game. Well guys, that's gonna do it for today. I hope you all enjoyed the video. I hope you guys learned something and I hope maybe you can apply some of that stuff to your own gameplay, whether you're playing with a serious pre-made or not. Remember, everything that I went over in this video was sort of assuming that you know both sides are playing max tryhard and have an optimal setup. Uh, that doesn't mean that you can't carry some of these things over to more casual play and definitely don't feel like there's only one team composition you can be successful with. Uh, as long as you put classes together um, that work well together and put classes in positions where they can really play to their strengths, you can find success against some of the better teams on your server, I'm sure. With that said, if you guys have any questions or if there's anything that you guys would like me to dive deeper into, maybe something I didn't go over that you would have liked me to talk about, let me know. I definitely want to keep the PvP content coming you guys' way. Definitely want to up my content output now that Classic is insanely close. So be on the lookout. That's all for me for today. Be sure to give me a follow on Twitter at OG Haptics and also, of course, on Twitch because that's where I'm going to be once Classic is out. Thank you guys for watching. See you next time.